Call upon the power of the Ultra Zord! The Power Rangers are one of the most recognizable brands in the world. Having run continuously for close to 20 years, it's one of the most beloved children's properties of all time. But what if the Power Rangers you know and love weren't really the Power Rangers at all at the very beginning? In fact, what if they weren't the second time around either? What if this was the third? See, the origins of the Power Rangers is a little weird, and the story of how it radically developed over its journey to the small screen, and specifically how its name was almost something entirely else, at one point even being Bioman, well, that's a story that's even stranger. Let's start at the beginning. Super Sentai is one of the longest running and most successful TV shows in Japanese history. Boasting nearly 50 years of consecutive programming, the action adventure series pits a team of brightly colored superheroes against a recurring cast of monsters and robots. This is the show that would eventually be brought to America and, well, would eventually be Power Rangers. Believe it or not, the first attempt at bringing Sentai to America actually happened during the 70s when Marvel Comics and the Japanese production company Toei carried out an intellectual property trade. Toei took Marv Wolfman, Gene Colan's Tomb of Dracula, Captain America, and Spider-Man, and Marvel took various concepts, one of them being Sun Vulcan. Stan Lee was purportedly very enthusiastic about the idea of adapting Sun Vulcan as a comedy series and putting together a pitch, but regrettably, nothing happened. No bites. Toei Spider-Man actually had a massive impact on tokusatsu and Sentai as a whole. In the show, Spider-Man has a massive robot he controls named Marveler, and this toy proved to be so popular with children that when Toei started to develop the next Sentai show, it was obvious that they should include a massive robot, which is how you get the formula that basically created every Sentai and Power Rangers show since, and, and really, a lot of things. You can see the influence of what you have on your screen right now, almost everywhere you look in modern day media. So almost a decade after Marvel failed to bring Sun Vulcan to America, surprise, surprise, Haim Saban, the man who would eventually succeed in bringing Sentai to the US, entered the picture. This was a man working in Japan on a business trip when he saw Super Sentai on Saturday morning TV. He became obsessed with the idea of using the suit segments of the show and refilming the unmasked segments with English speaking actors thereby gaining all the production value of the original show with only a small fraction of the actual cost. Say what you will about cutting corners, but this was a creative way to do it. We should note that he also received widespread critique over his business practices regarding compensation for actors who are involved with all his projects. And if you're interested in that, well, there's a video here, we'll put the link in the description, but that's not what this is about today. He was eventually able to strike a deal with Toei and he began the process of attempting to get American companies on board, which is notoriously difficult for Japanese properties. In 1985, after running into Dead End, after Dead End, he decided he needed to really show people what his vision was instead of just articulating it verbally in pitch meetings. Thus, he needed to produce a pilot for the series independently. And so, you take a look at the 30 television shows housed under the Sentai banner, and you pick one to adapt. He settled on Cho Denshi, Bioman. Roughly translated to Super Electron Bioman, <laughs> this show ran for 51 episodes from February 4th, 1984 to January 26th, 85. At the time, it was the most current Sentai show on the market. It also had a large following in Europe, France to be specific, and this led Saban to place all his chips on well, Bioman. The cast for this pilot is bizarrely impressive. The Red Ranger, aka Bio Rhythm Red, in this version referred to as Jason Lee, was played by none other than the martial arts legend Mark Dacascus. The character of Zach Taylor, who would be playing Bio Rhythm Green, will be played by Miguel A. Nunez Jr., whose genre fans will recognize from Return of the Living Dead, Black Dynamite, and Juana Man. The rest of the cast is filled out with Trisha Leigh Fisher, Tom Solardi, and Rebecca Staples. In a more bizarre turn, the footage for the pilot that's leaked since its release has some weird references in it. Miguel Nunez can be seen talking to a portly, blonde-haired man in that very pilot who is, in fact, comic icon Chris Farley. So this pilot became a do-or-die thing for Saban. After production was completed on the full pilot, he took it to every major network who did not share his enthusiasm for the material and passed on the project. The full pilot for Pio Man has not surfaced online to this day. Various actors involved with the Ranger have attested that they have seen it, but no one else really has. 
After five years of continually getting no's from people after that pilot in positions of power, Saban decided it was time to retool the idea altogether. He went back to the drawing board, feeling that biorhythms was something the development execs were probably bumping off of. He needed a cooler name for the individual Sentai characters, and he was absolutely right. Eventually, he landed on Rangers, finally rebranding the show to Galaxy Rangers. Yep. Galaxy Rangers. He retooled the pilot footage, cut it down, turning it into only a two-minute pilot pitch presentation, ostensibly an opening credits for an episode of Galaxy Rangers, and began making calls in May of 1992, attempting to find someone who would listen to this idea. He was able to finally set up a meeting with Fox Kids. In an enormously strange twist of fate, the executive that Saban was going to be pitching his remastered Sentai pitch to was Margaret Loesch, the head of Fox Kids and the former head of Marvel Productions, the company that had tried to sell Sun Vulcan as a show some 20 years prior. So someone that understood his position. Loesch watched the Galaxy Rangers pitch presentation, had a discussion with Saban, and then quickly decided that this would be a great way to jumpstart a new era at Fox Kids. And the rest is history. 20-something seasons, three movies, a sale to Disney, a name change, a purchase back from Disney, a partnership with Hasbro, a sale to Hasbro, a mountain of toys, and one of the most visible brands of all time. This isn't all that abnormal, right? Game of Thrones completely reshot their pilot after HBO got a look at it. Same thing with Star Trek. The original pilot episode titled The Cage was deemed too cerebral by CBS, and a new pilot had to be commissioned. The entire crew of the Enterprise was recast, even the captain. The only surviving character to make it into the broadcast pilot was Leonard Nimoy's Spock. Point being is that a lot of times, specifically in visual mediums, perseverance is the key. Not a key, the key to success. What would have happened if at any of the junctures along the way where people were telling Haim Saban that his idea was bad, had he stopped? Not only would we not have Power Rangers, but all of that work would have been for naught. This is a lesson in what to do when confronted with rejection. If you have something you genuinely believe in, you do what he did. You knuckle down and you work harder. You don't get prideful, you change, you adapt. You option concepts, negotiate rights deals, independently produce pilots, and then repackage those ideas over and over and over again until someone, that one person, that one meeting, finally lands. You've heard the saying a million times, don't take no for an answer. Now, let me be the first to tell you that is a horrible way of thinking. Do take no for an answer. Do understand no, not in life exclusively, but art specifically. No is good. When you learn to understand what no means in art, you learn to understand why you're hearing it. And sometimes, look, you have the greatest thing in the world and you're just talking to the wrong person. And in that case, well, you know in your heart of hearts to keep going. But a lot of the times, no means there's something that could be just a bit better. Maybe it's just a word in the title. Maybe it's just the length of your pilot. Maybe it's a page of your script. Maybe it's a color of your piece. But no is good. Take no for an answer. Learn from it. Compromise, adapt. No is a key to success. Failure is a key to success as long as you understand how to use it. Well guys, that's it for today's episode of Nostalgic. As always, if you enjoyed this video, press the like button down below. If you haven't yet done so, also hit subscribe. That way you won't miss anything that comes out on this channel. I'm on your screen right now, hopefully two more episodes of, well, Nostalgic. And I will see you guys in the next one.